Welcome to the Red Haired Archaeologist. I am your host, author, and sunscreen advocate, Amanda Hope Haley. Thank you for spending some time with me today, studying artifacts our first century Near Eastern ancestors left behind, and considering if those items just might change how we read or read into scripture. This is the second season of the Red-Haired Archaeologist podcast. And in the first season, I really focused on the Old Testament, which is easy to do because there are so many centuries and really millennia that are packed into the Old Testament. And season two, I really wanted to focus on artifacts that pertain to what we see in the New Testament. Israel has many artifacts and sites that come from that period, but understanding those really means having an understanding of the political history that was going on in the region right around the time of Jesus' birth. Because with the New Testament, we're only talking about a time period of, let's say, roughly 100 years when all of the books were written and, and put together. There's a lot packed in there in Israel, but it's for one very small period of time. And so what we really need to do to understand those is look outside the exact moments of the New Testament and see what's going on really in the Roman world surrounding Israel. Today, we're going to talk about Masada. We're going to take a little tour through there. And in order to understand it, what we really need to understand is Herod the Great. He is the guy who built that. This is one of his major building accomplishments. He did a lot of building while he was the king in Israel. But first, I think it's important to understand where he came from and how Israel ended up with a Roman citizen being king. So in order to do that, we're actually going to start off by talking a little bit about Alexander the Great. We're going to go all the way back to 323 BC, because that is when Alexander conquered Palestine. Alexander was a Macedonian. He brought with him the Hellenistic period. And he came in and conquered the region away from, if you're looking at your Bible, Darius was a Persian or uh, what people would call Neo-Persian. So Alexander came in and he was sort of the next empire to come and take control of the Levant region. So he did this about 323. And then he died shortly thereafter. He was only 32 years old. He was literally in the middle of a campaign trying to conquer the entire known world. He was one of those megalomaniacs. But he, of course, didn't expect to die at the age of 32. No one expected him to. So when he died, he didn't really leave instructions for what was to happen. So lots and lots of wars broke out. And the end result was that his territory got divided between his four greatest generals the Seleucid family, they were the ones who ended up getting control of Palestine. So when the Seleucids took control, one of the first things they started doing was appointing the high priests in Jerusalem, which obviously the Seleucids were not Jewish. They came from the Hellenistic tradition. So that was kind of a strange thing <laughs> from the outside. You have non-believers appointing really the head of the Jewish religion in Jerusalem. And so what happened pretty quickly is the process got corrupted and politics seeped into religion. That's an old story, and it's something that still happens today. And what tended to happen is whichever person was willing to do the most for the Seleucids or just simply pay them the most for the position, they were the ones who were put in control. After they'd held the region for over 100 years, one of the Seleucid kings, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, because of some skirmishes that were happening in the region, he actually outlawed Judaism. And he is the guy in 167 who allowed icons of Zeus to go into the temple and the worship of Zeus came in. In the Old Testament, there's places that talk about the desecration of the temple. And a lot of historians and even some people at the time would point to this as one of the abominations that happened in the temple was when Zeus came in and people were worshiping him instead of, instead of the one true God. Obviously, this was not good <laughs> for the Jews at the time, and this sort of ignited the Jewish wars. And if you listen to the last episode, season two, I referred a bit to the Maccabees, and the Maccabees, those books cover the periods of the Jewish wars. So we're right back sort of in the same time period that we were talking about last week. I think it's important to understand that politics because that is the backdrop. That is what was going on in the world when Jesus is born. 
So in the 160s and in the decades following it, the Maccabees, they rise up, they attack the Seleucids because of what else is going on in the region. The Seleucid Empire is at roughly the same time being attacked by Rome, being attacked by the Parthian Empire, and then they're also experiencing internal struggles. That was the perfect time for the Jewish wars, for the Jews to rise up, and they end up winning and founding what they named the Hasmonean dynasty. They have a certain amount of power for the next several decades, largely at the Romans' pleasure. They're just allowed to be there until the year 66. So about 100 years after Antiochus Epiphanes stuck Zeus in the temple, Pompey comes from Rome and he attacks the area and he ends up conquering Palestine for the Romans. We're still in BCE timeline here. Two decades later, in the year 47, Herod, who would eventually become King Herod, he is 26 years old. And his father happened to make some really good political moves, and he was a close friend of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar had made Herod's father a Roman citizen. That Roman citizenship was not just bestowed on him, but on his future generations as well. So he becomes a Roman citizen, and then he's given the title of procurator of all of Judea. So when Herod's dad becomes procurator of all of Judea, then he turns around and says, hey, 26-year-old Herod, let me give you some power, and makes him the governor of Galilee. Then about seven years later, the Parthian Empire, who is still on the outskirts of Judea, they end up attacking. And Herod and a lot of the leaders of the political party end up fleeing to Rome. And while Herod is there, the Roman Senate gets together and they decide to elect him king of all of Judea. So Herod then in 37 has to turn around, go back to Jerusalem, to Judea, and conquer the Hasmoneans. He pushes them out. Rome helps him to do this. Some Jews in the area help him to do this. And just to further solidify his power, Herod divorces his first wife and marries a Hasmonean princess. Lots of your old court political intrigue was happening there to get him in power. Herod, from a building perspective, had a really successful time in office <laughs> as king. He spent about 30 years building magnificent cities and fortresses and palaces. When he got into Jerusalem after the wars and everything, the temple that was there obviously needed some repairs. But more than that, he went on to build the extensive courtyards and really push out the, the perimeter of that property to the point where, of course, if you go to Jerusalem today, you can go and visit the Wailing Wall. Understand the Wailing Wall is, it's not Solomon's Temple. Solomon's Temple was destroyed, and um, that happened in 586. It is not even Nehemiah's temple. That would have been up on top of the platform. What the Wailing Wall is, is the foundation of the platform that Herod built to go around the temple to make it a larger facility, um, modernize it, make it far more impressive than it started off to be. So that's what the Wailing Wall is. And we'll actually talk a lot more about the temple that's in Jerusalem in episode 10 when we wrap up the season. But he did that one, which I know you know about. He also built the synagogue that is over the cave of Machpelah, and we're going to talk about that a lot in episode eight. That is in the West Bank, and it is divided today. It is half synagogue, half mosque. That is a fascinating story all its own. That'll come in episode eight. But one of the other major things that he did was the fortress of Masada, and we're almost there. But before we talk about that, just to finish up the story of him, Herod is described as being in a lot of pain. And what scholars have said is that he suffered from a very painful hardening of the arteries. I think it's something really common to us today. We hear about it a lot, but that, I don't know if it was causing other problems, but he was physically in pain. And then he also was just surrounded by a lot of political intrigue. There are stories of the people in his family being particularly vicious. He became paranoid. He became incredibly violent as he aged. He murdered his wife. He murdered much of her Hasmonean family out of political fears. He murdered his firstborn son. He put down a revolt. And then, of course, in the New Testament, you read about him ordering the slaying of all of the infants in Bethlehem. 
that is completely in line with the stories of his character in later life. And then he even attempted suicide shortly before he died. He died in 4 BC. That is important, too, when you're reading scripture and trying to figure out exactly when Jesus was born. I have mentioned in previous podcasts the difference between using a BCE or CE timeline versus BCAD. And one of the reasons a lot of people are moving away from BCAD is because historically, if you're reading the Bible and you believe that Jesus was targeted by Herod the Great's infanticide attempt in Bethlehem, then obviously he was there in 4 BCE. So it's pretty difficult to have Jesus being born four years before Christ came. This is one of the reasons that we use BCE today as well. That's just a little, little side note. If you ever go to schedule a trip to Israel and you're asking people for advice, everyone is going to say, go to Masada. And in this case, absolutely everyone would be correct. If you're going to go up there, you need to do your best to carve out an entire day. It is a massive site. It has been really well excavated and conserved. Just everything that you see there, even if you don't end up spending the whole day there, it's a place that you after you visit, you want to spend some time thinking about, thinking about everything that happened there. This city, let's call it a city, it's located on top of a cliff that hangs over the Dead Sea. It's about halfway between En Gedi in the north. If you're a Bible reader, that is where David cut Saul's cloak in 1 Samuel 24. David and Saul were warring against each other, and David had the opportunity to kill Saul when he was in a very vulnerable position, basically going to the bathroom. And David snuck in there and cut a corner off of his cloak, basically to say, hey, I could have killed you, but I didn't. So that happens in 1 Samuel 24, and that happens at En Gedi, which is this lovely little oasis. It's about, uh, I'm going to say 20 or 30 minute drive north of Masada, something like that. And then about the same distance south of Masada is Mount Sodom that traditionally has been determined to be the place where Lot's wife um, in Genesis, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed and Lot and his family are leaving and Lot's wife out of immense sorrow turns around and looks back and she turns into a pillar of salt. Well, at Mount Sodom, there is a, a particular pillar there that is called Lot's wife. So that gives you an idea of where Masada is located. It's really, really high. And so it gives you great visibility. There's nothing really around it except for the Dead Sea. All of the salt and the extremely low altitude mean that not a whole lot of things grow around there. And so it's an excellent site for a fortress. Great sight lines. If any army is approaching from many, many, many miles away, you're going to see them in plenty of time. Plus, it's just perched up on top of this cliff, and so it's incredibly difficult to get to. So it's hard to attack. It's also easy to defend. And so Herod was making a wise choice in choosing this area for his winter palace for those reasons. Of course, it's not a particularly comfortable place, but we'll talk about how he changed all of that. According to the historian Josephus, Herod got busy and built the city there between 37 and 31 BCE. And I want to stick in here just a note about Josephus. I know when I was growing up, I would hear about Josephus, see his books. I'm sure we had a Josephus book in our bookcase somewhere. And I almost thought of him as being close to scripture. But it's important to understand who Josephus was historically. From a literary perspective, it is safe to say that he is what one would call an unreliable narrator. He is certainly not divinely inspired. He was not even just an historian trying to get the truth down. He actually was a Jew who deserted his side in battle, switched over to the Roman Empire, and kind of cozied up to them. And so the Romans actually were the people who hired him to write the great Josephus works called the Jewish Wars. And ultimately, those are propaganda pieces. There's a lot in Josephus that after lots of archaeological discovery and then also just comparing historical records, there's a lot that scholars who specialize in him have found to be untrue. And so that holds true for Masada as well. So he's the one source that tells us that Masada was built between 37 and 31. And I mean, that's probably correct. There's really no reason to doubt that. But a lot of other things that he says can be questioned and really should be questioned. 
So don't accept Josephus's gospel because he simply is not. So when you as a visitor get to Masada, it's right off the Dead Sea. You see the visitor center from several miles away. You drive up there, you park, and you have a choice to make at the very beginning. And that is how you're going to get from the visitor center, which, by the way, is really impressive. There are videos, restaurants, shops, all sorts of information, multiple museums. You can spend several hours there with no problem before you even go up to the top. But I would recommend that you go up to the top first, if for no other reason than the heat. This is the Dead Sea. And when you're at the Dead Sea, and of course, we were there in August, which is about the worst possible time probably to visit. It is incredibly hot. The air is thick with the salt. And I believe that you can physically feel the pull of gravity of being just that much closer to the center of the earth. It feels different when you're down at the Dead Sea. When you go visit Masada, you want to take advantage of the coolest part of the day. So do your best to get up there just as soon as it opens. And so you're going to need to make a choice. And that is between taking a tram. And I, I can't remember. It costs maybe like $10 or something. It's about a three-minute ride. I mean, it's a tram, like they have other places. And that in itself is great. It's air conditioned for one thing. But you can also look out and just it has amazing views and you can take all sorts of gorgeous pictures. And that is a good choice. Or if you're adventurous and you're a hiker, you can take the snake path. It's called the snake path because it winds back and forth. It is incredibly steep, so you need to be in really good shape physically to do it. And you absolutely have to do that early. In fact, the Masada is a national park and the parks directors kind of determine when to let that be open, when to let it be closed. And in fact, when we were there this last time, the snake path was closed for fear of people having heat stroke and dehydration from taking it. It was simply too hot to take. So when you get up on top of the cliff, however you choose to do it, You'll see there are lots of major buildings that you want to, well, you want to go see the whole thing. But the major buildings there are a commandant's residence. There are two palaces there, a northern palace and a western palace. And that's actually one of the reasons Josephus, his description of Masada is in question. In this story that he gives of Masada in the Jewish Wars, he only ever mentions one palace. So historians will say it is unlikely that he would have left the second palace out. But anyway. Those are up there. Everything that is up on that site, Herod had his people quarrying rocks from the immediate vicinity and taking it up there and building all of the buildings from that. They were built to last and they were built of materials that geologically were used to the Dead Sea area. So, I mean, they were going to survive. I mean, had they not been attacked. <laughs> but it wasn't just there for structure. Everything was absolutely beautiful. A lot has been restored, and so you can sort of imagine the floors of so many of these buildings were cut mosaics. Most of them are geometrical. Some of them are black and white. A lot of them are full color. Walls and ceilings were frescoed. Those were found, and specialists, when the initial excavations were done, a lot of these were, they were left in place, then they end up being damaged, and so then some specialists came and took them away and stored them for several decades, but they have now been restored and reinstalled. And so you can see the vibrancy of the color that was in a lot of these places at the time. This would have been an incredibly beautiful place against this stark, you know, browns and grays background that surrounds you because of the Dead Sea. So all of that was put in architecturally, but then key to life there and key to bringing other colors of vegetation were the water system. This was an incredibly impressive water system. Herod, first off, he considered the terrain and he went and he built a system of dams that would collect water and run off during the winter rainy season, not just from the particular cliff where his city was built, but from the surrounding cliffs. So that water would be trapped. And then he built channels, and the channels would move the water into cisterns that were placed on the slopes surrounding the city. And then pack animals would go and get water from those lower cisterns and take them up onto the plateau, up to where the actual city was for use there and what use they made of the water. The water was used for pools, recreational and religious 
there are multiple pools up there. There are several bathhouses. And these bathhouses, they have tepid rooms, hot rooms, and steam rooms. I mean, they figured out how to get cold water up there. <laughs> there, there are storerooms that microbiologists have gone in and they've been able to determine what kinds of foods and everything were stored there. So your foods were grown up there in the city. Massive banquets were held there. So water was used not just to grow the food, also for people simply to drink. This was one of the more recent discoveries up at Masada was there were actually active vineyards in the area. And so when the people living in this palatial royal city were walking around, they would have been walking among and even under grapevines. So it would have been an incredibly lush place to be. It was really pure luxury at the bottom of the earth. So Herod dies in 4 BCE. At that point, the Roman Empire decided to clamp down harder on Judea. And you see the rumblings of that in the Gospels, in the later writings of the New Testament. That's sort of the backdrop to why so many Jews were looking for a Messiah who would be a political leader. They were looking for someone who would come and kick Rome out for good. So there's this increasing pressure on the region until it reaches a breaking point about 66 CE. And that's when something called the Great Jewish Revolt begins. At this point, a group of rebels from Jerusalem end up fleeing and they go down to Masada and they capture it. At the time, it was, it was obviously not largely inhabited. It was just basically an outpost of the Roman army. So they were able to take it relatively easily. And they set up camp there. So that's in 66. And... For the next three years, as Rome is attacking different Jewish communities, more and more Jews are coming south, coming to live at Masada, until finally in 70, the temple in Jerusalem is completely destroyed. And that's when Masada sees sort of its last wave of refugees coming down to it. So for the next three years, the Jewish refugees are living in community there. There's archaeological evidence of them doing some construction of their own, building their own ritual baths, that sort of thing, so that they can live a whole life under God as much as possible. Rome has pretty much taken every bit of Judea that they want. And in 73 CE, Masada is really the last holdout of the Jewish rebels. At that point, 8,000 Roman troops come to the area they set up camp below Masada, just sort of on the edge of the Dead Sea. They set up camps. They build a siege wall for themselves. They build ramps that go up the side of the cliff. And after a few months of doing all that construction and then exacting basically a starvation strategy on the people who were there, they go ahead and they bring in what are called siege machines. In the ancient world, there are these towers that have battering rams on them. And they take it up those siege ramps that they had built, and they start attacking the city wall itself. There is archaeological evidence of all of this. You can still actually see the siege ramps when you go to visit the site. When you're up on top, they make it really easy to imagine being attacked. Well, so when the Jews see this aggressive campaign coming their way, we don't know what was going through their minds. All we have is Josephus' account of this story. This is why I brought him up earlier and mentioned that he may not be the most dependable narrator in the world because obviously he was not there. But according to Josephus, what happened was all the men of the community, and it was a community of 960 people living there at the time, just under a thousand. All the men got together, and they drew lots, and they selected 10 men from among them. Those 10 were charged with going and killing all of the inhabitants of the city. And then once everyone was dead except for those 10 men, then those 10 men drew lots again and chose one. And that one man then was charged with killing the other nine and then committing suicide himself. This story is only told in The Great Wars by Josephus. And according to him, the story came from two women and five children who had escaped the slaughter. When the Romans got up to Masada, they found everyone dead except for these inhabitants, and this was the story that they told to them. 
When the initial excavations were done by Yigal Yadin, they discovered 10 pottery sherds, that is S-H-E-R-D-S. Um, they're just broken pieces of pottery, not shards, but sherds. Little tidbit for you there. They discovered 10 sherds that had men's names written on them. And this was initially interpreted as supporting Josephus' story of what had happened on top of Masada. But as excavations continued, and at this point, pretty much every area has been touched. There were only 28 bodies that were found when you would have expected closer to 960 bodies. Today, scholars look at everything that's been excavated and they consider all of the places where Josephus had things not quite right or completely wrong in all of his writings. The new trend among scholars is to say that these pottery shards aren't so much evidence that this horrific event happened on top of Masada, but that they were actually left behind that the Roman army came in and killed and captured people, as they do, and then these shards were simply left behind, that they had been used during the three years that the Jews had been living on top of Masada, that they had been used for general administrative practices, the elders getting together and deciding, you know, who was going to do what, who was going to bring water up, who was going to clean this, who was going to prepare food, you know, whatever needed to happen for the city. That would have been done by drawing lots. One thing I love about these being found is it's a great visual of what drawing lots was in the ancient world. I think a lot of our Bible translations, when Jesus is on the cross and it talks about the Roman soldiers casting lots for his clothes, I think we all picture initially like them basically playing a dice game down at the base of the cross. And that's not what casting lots was. I tend to say drawing lots instead of casting lots. What they would do, and this is throughout the Bible, this is how Saul was chosen as king of Israel, was by drawing lots. The men would write their names on a piece of pottery and cast the lot into some sort of a container, a bag, something like that. And then someone would draw the name out of it. It's not so much playing with dice, a game of chance, casting your lots the lots were actually drawn out. So this is archaeologically great visual of how society was being governed at the time up on the top of Masada. It may or may not indicate that the horrors that Josephus described, I mean, I for one hope that it doesn't, <laughs> and that the archaeology is really disagreeing with, at this point, thousands of years of thought of what happened up there. Archaeology is pointing us in a different direction. If you enjoyed this episode of The Red-Haired Archaeologist, then I hope you will listen again soon. New episodes are released each Friday. To learn more about me, check out my website, redhairedarchaeologist.com. There you will find links to my books, this podcast, and my blog, where you can interact with me and other listeners. Also look for my new book, The Red-Haired Archaeologist Digs Israel. It is available now as a print book, ebook, and audiobook from all of your favorite retailers. 